Next up, we have Harlan talking about Reg Ripper 3. So the version 3 upgrade and all of the exciting things in there. Um, Harlan has been a, a long-term attendee of OSDFCon. I believe you may have been at the first one uh, as well. Um, he is uh, submitted a video. So we have a video uh, of him with his presentation on Red Ripper, uh, but he is on the channels. Uh, so you can send questions his way and he will answer them from there. So with that, I hand it over to Harlan's video. Hello everyone, my name is Harlan Carvey and I'd like to thank you all for tuning in and attending this year's virtual open source digital forensics conference. It's truly an honor to be presenting again and I'd like to thank all of you who voted for my presentation during the crowdsourcing of this year's agenda. And I promise to provide everyone with the same presentation, even if you didn't vote for me. I'd also like to thank Brian and his dedicated team for putting the conference on. And I'd like to give a special thank you and shout out to Brian's fabulous hair. Today, I'll be discussing effectively using Red Ripper version 3.0. I will be answering questions via the Discord channel, both during and after this presentation. So what is Red Ripper? This question was recently posed as a comment to a blog post announcing and describing the release of Red Ripper version 3. Red Ripper is an open source tool for extracting, translating, and displaying data and metadata from offline registry formatted files. I say registry formatted as Red Ripper works equally well on files that comprise the registry, such as the software and system hives, as well as similarly Similarly formatted files that do not constitute and are not part of the registry, such as the AMCache file, as well as application-specific settings.dat files. Red Ripper is written in Perl and uses a Perl module that does not rely on Windows API calls. As a result, Red Ripper can be run on platforms that support the Perl scripting language. However, the primary Red Ripper tools, the GUI and command line interface tools, are also compiled into Windows executables. Again, Red Ripper is intended specifically to be used with offline files, such as those files extracted using the regsave command, files extracted from an acquired image, or via some other means. The Windows registry contains a great deal of information that can significantly impact an investigation. For example, the registry contains keys and values that dictate system behavior, determines whether or not various Windows event logs are enabled, determines what a user sees on their desktop and what tools they can access, and tracks user activities. The registry can also provide information regarding insider threat or illicit image cases, and can even help determine the difference between production and possession of those images. Additional information from the registry can help identify which applications last accessed the webcam or the system microphone. Red Ripper provides a framework for the targeted extraction, translation, and display of this information for the analyst. The Red Ripper tools, rr.exe and rip.exe, are simply intended to support running plugins, which are Perl scripts written to look for specific data within the registry. I should note that Red Ripper does not, I repeat, does not automatically process transaction logs. Red Ripper will tell you if the hive is dirty, meaning there that there is data in the transaction logs that have not been written to the hive, but it will not automatically process those transaction logs. Instead, if the analyst has a specific need to process the transaction logs based on the goals of their analysis, Red Ripper does provide recommendations for tools that can be used. One of the things I value about using Red Ripper is that plugins can be created or modified very quickly, almost immediately bringing new capabilities to bear with an investigation. There have been times when I've used Red Ripper during an investigation and found an interesting thread. Pulling that thread led to a finding, which resulted in a new or updated plugin, which then added greater granularity and context to my investigation. In some cases, all of this has happened within an hour. Red Ripper plugins are again or Perl scripts, and as such can be opened in any editor, such as the Notepad. Doing this can provide insight into specific keys and values accessed and how value data is parsed. The headers of the plugins include a change history and will very often include a URL to a website that indicates what led to the plugin being created or explains the data extracted. The biggest challenge of Red Ripper remains correct interpretation of the data. There is a great deal of very valuable data within the registry 
and it's not always the best idea to view that information in isolation from other data sources. By correlating data from other sources, analysts can better understand the nature of what they're seeing, as well as provide greater context and granularity to provide a more accurate interpretation. The latest version of Red Ripper, version 3.0, has a number of updates over the previous version. One of the main updates is that the display format for timestamps has been changed to align with the format specified by ISO 8601. Timestamps are still displayed to UTC, but I say align with because the ISO specifies a T separator between the date and time. As a result, the displayed timestamps are more closely aligned with RFC 3339. The purpose of this update was to make the displayed timestamps more useful for international users, as well as make searching a bit easier. As you would expect, the latest version of Red Ripper has a number of new or updated plugins. For example, a number of plugins that extracted data or metadata with respect to an off a user's MS Office application usage were merged into a single plugin. However, I felt there may be a need to quickly check for links that the user clicked on in Office documents or within an Outlook email, so I created a separate plugin named Link Click to extract that value data so that analysts could quickly display just that information and not have to wade through the rest of the output from the more inclusive plugin. I also removed a number of older malware specific plugins. That is, Red Ripper version 2.8 had a number of older plugins that looked for keys and values associated with specific malware variants. Many of these were based on malware variants that are no longer prevalent nor widely observed. I had also started accumulating a number of similar checks in a plugin named Malware. However, that plugin name was not entirely descriptive, so I pulled several of the more valuable checks out of that plugin and created separate plugins, or incorporated those checks into other plugins. An important note regarding plugins. Plugins from Red Ripper version 2.8 can be dropped into the version 3.0 plugins folder and run with no issues. However, the reverse is not the case. Red Ripper version 3.0 plugins cannot be used with version 2.8 without modification. As you can see from the Red Ripper graphic in the slide, there have been some changes to the GUI application as well. One you can see right away is the inclusion of the warning that Red Ripper does not automatically process transaction logs. Instead, the note recommends two tools you can use to process registry transaction logs if you determine that you need to do so. Finally, you can also see in the graphic that the profile selector has been removed from the user interface. With version 3.0, the analyst no longer needs to select a profile after selecting a hive to parse. Instead, Red Ripper will determine the hive type, that is, if the target hive is a software hive, system hive, intuser.dat, amcache hive, etc., and then automatically compile a list of all plugins that apply to that hive type and then run them. Analysts using the Red Ripper GUI no longer need to select a profile, as all applicable plugins will be run against the Hive. Analysts can still make use of profiles via Red Ripper's command line tool. Red Ripper version 3.0 is available on GitHub, and the URL is listed at the bottom of the slide. The command line tool for Red Ripper, rip.exe, also has a couple of updates as well. This slide shows those updates taken right from the rip.exe rip usage syntax. While you can still run rip.exe using individual plugins or using profiles, you can also see that if a hive is dirty, meaning that there is, a, that there is data in the transaction logs that has not been written to the hives, or you can check for the hive type. You can also run all plugins with report output that apply to the hive. This is the same functionality provided by the GUI version of the tool. Or you can choose to run only those plugins with five field timeline output that apply to the selective hive. This is something I kind of added for myself as it makes things pretty simple when creating timelines, especially using data from the user's profile. Again, analysts still have the capability to create and run their own profiles based on their own processes and implementing their own playbooks. Given all this new functionality, how do we use Red Ripper effectively? The effectiveness of tools like Red Ripper depends heavily upon the goals of your investigation, as well as upon the version of Windows you're examining and the applications in installed. 
our analysis goals tells us what we're looking for, which in turn points us to where we need to look. This is the basis of Chris Pogue's sniper forensics and the Alexiou principle, which were recently described in Hexacore's blog. Next, we need to keep in mind that Red Ripper may not be complete out of the box. While Red Ripper has more than a few plugins that are extremely useful, it cannot be expected to include plugins that apply to every possible application, and as such may miss stuff that is pertinent or forensically relevant to your investigation. The key to addressing this is to, again, understand the goals of your investigation. The best way to use Red Ripper effectively is to take findings from a previous case, open sources, and from pulled threads from your current case, and bake these findings into your analysis process as plugins or profiles. For example, the Landesk application contains a software monitoring tool that records applications being launched, as well as the last time they were launched and by which user. This is similar to turning on process tracking in the security event log, but is stored in the registry. This is not a capability afforded by all monitoring tools. In 2009, a fellow analyst named Don Weber had seen this data in the registry and wrote the first iteration of a plugin to extract and display the data. Another example is the WebRoot antivirus application, which maintains a history of detected threats within the registry. In the past, some AV applications have written detections to the application event log, as well as to a text-based log file, and others have written detections to vendor-specific event log files. This past spring, I was assisting with a ransomware case involving a variant usually associated with the Drydex banking trojan. However, the analyst was unable to find any indication of Drydex on the system. Reviewing the software hive, I found the information maintained beneath the WebRoot antivirus key. Within about an hour, had a working plugin. Adding the information from the registry to a timeline, we were able to see, clearly see the full breadth of the malicious activity on the system, including the WebRoot AV detecting and quarantining the Drydex trojan. This detection caused a delay, forcing the threat actor to find another means of establishing a foothold on the system. These are just examples of how quickly findings discovered during analysis can be baked back into the analysis process, adding context and granularity to the current investigation. I liken this process to the overlays teacher used to use in class with an overhead projector. Of course, I'm dating myself. By adding the new information to an additional sheet of acetate, the overall picture can be developed and brought into view by overlaying the new sheet. Many of the plugins <clears throat> that I've created are the result of a combination of reviewing open source, reporting, and testing. For example, earlier this year, I read a pen test lab blog article that described several methods for establishing persistence on a system by performing something referred to as RID hijacking. <clears throat> this is, there was a similar article from the Stealth Bits blog from November 2018, so this is not a new thing as of 2020. However, I was able to follow one of the me methods described in the Pentest Lab article and modify the Samparse plugin to detect RID hijacking. Just a little while ago, I read an article about how the native Windows Registry Editor, or RegEdit, allows the user to select favorites similar to bookmarks in a web browser. I opened RegEdit on my system, selected some favorites, extracted the ntuser.dat file from my profile, and using that same data, wrote a plugin. In the future, this plugin may help me identify humanness or human intent during an examination, because at this point, it seems to require human interaction for the values to be populated, and the value th values themselves can provide indications of intent. Novel persistence mechanisms or defense evasion techniques identified through open source threat intel reporting are always excellent sources for Red Ripper plugins. Not too long ago, I read, ran across a reference to the mini NT key via social media. The posts I found during my investigation indicated that simply adding this key to the registry disables the security event log. I found a blog post that described, along with screen captures, the detrimental effect that adding this key has on the event viewer and proceeded to test and validate these findings. From there, the next logical step was to write a plugin to detect this key. Copy and pasting a similar plugin resulted in a new plugin within 15 minutes. The result of this is that now I have a plugin that documents the issue and findings and that I can run on every engagement going forward. 
Like the plugin that checks to see which Windows event log channels are enabled, this plugin can provide information that clarifies any anomalies I might see in the Windows event log during an investigation. So why is any of this important? At the moment, there are over 250 plugins in the Red Ripper 3.0 distribution, and there is no way I can remember each and every one of the keys and values that are extracted, and that doesn't include the plugins that iterate through multiple subkeys and collect all values without extracting them individually by name. Trying to remember all of this for every investigation is impossible. However, if I write a plugin, I can then incorporate that plugin into my analysis playbook, implement it in a profile, and I don't have to memorize all those valuable or even critical bits and pieces. Rather than taking a run all the things approach via the Red Ripper GUI, the analysts can automate runbooks or playbooks via the use of profiles, which are still available via the rip.exe command line tool, and they and then modify these profiles as necessary. For example, why run all possible plugins against a hive and search the output if I'm only interested in USB devices, such as thumb drives, smartphones, or digital cameras that have been attached to the system. The challenge with the kitchen sink approach is that there's a lot of output to wade through, whereas focusing on the goals of the investigation and the data required to support those goals may help the analyst determine the difference between possession and production of illicit images. Or if the analyst is examining a system that may have been used for espionage or extortion why not determine which applications access the webcam and microphone rather than running all possible plugins? Some functionality I've considered adding for a future version of Red Ripper includes the use of categories, MITRE attack framework mappings, analysis tips, and references. These are not things that have been requested, but rather functionality that I found interesting and thought might be useful to others. These categories are brief, description, brief descriptive terms such as program execution, defense evasion, user activity, etc. For example, defense evasion might apply if registry settings are used to disable Windows Defender as a means of impairing defenses. The use of categories can help structure the approach taken to extracting data from Hive files for analysis by aligning the extraction with the goals of the investigation. For example, if you're looking for common or novel persistence mechanism, then user activity or system configuration data doesn't necess won't necessarily be of interest or value to your investigation. I thought that adding analysis tips to the output of plugins would make the data that many of them extracted a bit more valuable to analysts. My hope is that analysis tips and references will help analysts understand why data or metadata is being extracted by a particular plugin and how that data can be used to further the investigation. While it's possible that a key last write time or a timestamp extracted from value data is of interest, understanding a bit more about why the plugin was written in the first place might provide the analyst with additional value or context. As a final note, I would simply ask that any requests regarding Red Ripper be considered thoughtfully. When I when I was asked to change the structure of the displayed timestamps in Red Ripper version 2.8, the request was structured as a, hey, you do this. The changes need to be applied to 346 plugins. As there was no offer to assist with this, the change took several months to complete. Some requests simply can't be serviced in a timely manner. However, when the request to clear the main text field of the Red Ripper GUI between runs was submitted, it was a relatively easy change as it only required two lines of code to be added to a single file. Requests that result in a new or modified plugin are best served if sample data is provided along with the request. If your request is to have all plugins output in JSON or XML format, please consider forking the project. Thank you very much for your time and attention today. I hope this presentation has been informative to you. If there are any questions, I will be available in the Discord channel. Or if questions come up later, please feel free to reach out to me via email. My email address can be found in just about every plugin. Again, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Harlan, for that overview of what's new in Red Ripper 3.0. I saw him in Discord, so asking questions. So thanks for the information and thanks for providing that feedback.